Chapter 34 Smoke Time passed. Cat and Mum came downstairs arm in arm. I hadn't seen them like that, like that in a while. I was able to deduce from their body language they had made up, and this made me pleased because it showed how much better I was getting at reading body language. Then Aunt Gloria came down in her dressing gown. Her lips were flat and her eyes empty looking. So I didn't know what her body language was saying, and I was less pleased. Dad and Rashid went out to fetch an Indian takeaway for everyone. They returned with a dozen foil containers of steaming food. I had two samosas, a chicken biryani and a motor cat's chicken korma, which she couldn't finish. Dad got most of the way for a prawn booner. As for the others, mounds of food got, food got left on their plates. Aunt Gloria nibbled at one side of an onion bhaji for half an hour. Mum's fork went round her plate, pushing the same chickpea. But she'd sipped a beer and stared at his food without even starting. How was work? Mum said to Dad. He shrugged. Quiet. I was out Peckham Way today on another job. Then nobody spoke. I wanted to tell them what I knew all about my conversation with Detective Pierce, but... She told me not to say anything for now, just in case people started to hope. She explained that normally hope is a good thing. But if you hope a lot for something and it doesn't happen, then you're disappointed. It's called being let down. I asked her if being let down is like coming back to earth, the bump if you let your air out of a hot air balloon too fast. And she said yes, it was just like that. Then that started another train of thought. That hot air ballooning was something I'd try one day, but only when the weather was, fe- was set fair. And I'd bring instruments for measuring air pressure and temperature and make recordings in Houston calling planet Pluto, Dad said. I looked over at Dad. This is what he says to get my attention when my thoughts are far away from where my body is. Pass the rice, Ted, he said, smiling. I passed the rice and there was silence again, as if everybody had decided that Salem was not to be mentioned. Cat kept winding a brown curl of hair around her finger. Aunt Gloria lit a cigarette but forgot to smoke it. I watched it burn away and followed the trail of smoke through the air as it burned. It was deflected to the left over to the left over her shoulder. Although there were no window open and no air in the room, this made me think of the Coriolis effect again and how it is invisible but makes things change direction. Aunt Gloria, I said. Shh, Ted, Mum said. No, let him say what he wanted to say, said Aunt Gloria. Why are you lighting cigarettes and not smoking them? I asked. Ted, said Mum. Give Aunt Glow a break. Aunt Gloria gave a tiny smile. I didn't even notice I'd lit one, Ted. I'll tell you what, when this is over, if Salem, if he comes back safe, I'll give the damn things up, as a promise. She sat back down. Tears going down her face and took a long drag. I wasn't sure if she was crying at the thought of having to give up cigarettes or because Salem might not come back safely. The room went quiet again. If he comes back safe, she repeated, which was how I knew she was crying because of Salem, not the cigarettes. I carried on eating. When I put my knife and fork down, I listened to the silence. I heard the clock ticking again. Then I felt blood pounding in my ears. It was like railway wheels going round in my head. Trains of thought running out of control. Couplers snapping. snapping. The boy on the slab, the boy on the train. Mum made a pot of tea. I heard a spoon rapping against China as Dad stirred his new shiver. Salem or not Salem? I can't stand it anymore, Aunt Gloria said. She leaped up. The waiting, I can't stand it. Mum reached out and put a hand on Aunt Gloria's wrist. I know, Glow. Sit down. You don't know. You can't know. Cat and Ted, they've never disappeared. Not like this. Not for more than two days. And nothing. No news. Nothing. Calm down, Gloria, said Rashid. How can I? You're all sitting there. You're looking at me. I know what you're thinking. Glow, Mum said. Don't you start. I overheard you today on the phone to Ben. You think Salem's run away, don't you? You think he's hiding, hiding from me, don't you? Why won't you just say it? Glow, Mum said. Go on, say it. Maybe the choice is between Salem being kidnapped by some evil person or his hiding somewhere, unaware of how much distress he's causing you. Then yes, I do. That is, I... You're saying it's my fault, that I brought this on myself. No, Glow, not that. But maybe going to New York for Salem was a step to... It wasn't, it wasn't, Aunt Gloria cried out. I know my own boy. He wouldn't do this to me. I know. She turned from the table. The sleeve of her dressing gown caught her plate and an onion bargey went flying. Her shoulders shook. I'm going to go out there and find him. I am. I don't care if I have to walk on from one end of the London to the other. She staggered through the door into the hallway. Mum jumped up. Glow, don't go. I didn't mean... From where I was sitting, I could see Aunt Gloria opening the front door, fiddling with the handle. Get lost, Faye, she shouted. Oh, stop her, Ben, Mum said. She's out of her mind. 
Dad looked dazed, got to his feet. Cat got up too. Rashid sat still, his mouth hanging open. Just as Aunt Gloria opened the front door, a siren came wailing up the right, ha- right outside. Lights flashed. There were voices in the front garden, people moving, confusion. A chair fell over and Rashid rocked on his chair and started groaning. Please, God, no, please, no, he said. A bad feeling went up my esophagus. The police had come and just when Detective Inspector Pierce had told me they would. But I hadn't expected the siren. And it didn't sound like the sirens did when that, when I played ambulance with a cat. It sounded real and near and loud and bad. The boy on the train, the boy on the slab, Salem or not Salem. I put my hands over my ears. The general synopsis at 1900, low for its wife, 1008, unexpected just to west of Rockall. Chapter 35. The boy on the train again. Detective Inspector Pierce entered the house, leading Aunt Gloria by the elbow. She guided her into the kitchen and sat her down. She looked like she needs a warm drink, the inspector said. She's in a state of shock. Cat poured a cup of tea. Rashid got up to give his place to Aunt Gloria and he sat down and stroked her hair. Her hands shook and her lips chattered together as if she'd just come in from a snowstorm, although it was warm and humid outside, about 18 degrees. Is there news? Mum said. Detective Inspector Pierce didn't reply until Aunt Gloria had taken a sip of her drink. I felt Cat's hand in mine, gripping hard. Inspector Pierce shook her head. Some news, but neither good nor bad. It's more an update, courtesy of Ted. Everybody stared at me. Ted, said Mum. Ted, said Dad. Ted, said Cat. I didn't say anything. I looked at the kitchen floor. Ted has worked out what happened to Salem the day he disappeared. Detective Inspector Pierce continued. His conclusions agreed with where our inquiries are heading. But I have to say, he got there before us. Ted, Cat said again. Her mouth was open and her jaw hung down. We followed up on what Ted told us, but as yet we still don't know where Salem is. Aunt Gloria moaned and put her head in her hands, but we know who the boy on the train was. Salem, said Mum. Ted to Inspector Pierce, his hands went apart. Not Salem, she said. This is the boy on the train here. Another woman police officer in uniform came into the room. With her was a boy, about Salem's age, but not Salem. He was half hiding behind the officer's tall body. He was chubby around the cheeks, dark haired and Asian looking, although it was hard to see him properly as he wore the hood of his sweatshirt over his head and part of his face. You! Aunt Gloria gasped. Hello, Marcus, I said. Chapter 36. Weather detection. Suppose you want to know how I worked it out. Or maybe your brain works on a different operating system from other people's like mine and you've worked it out too. I'd done nothing but think two minutes past noon on the day Salem disappeared. Monday, when I phoned the police at 1804. Wednesday, that's 54 hours and two minutes of thinking. If you count sleeping time, which I do, you go on thinking in your sleep. I'd gone over the nine theories again and again. and We discounted theories one, two and eight by checking them out. Salem couldn't have stayed on that pod for another ride, nor had my watch gone wrong, nor could he have hidden under somebody's clothes without noticing. Cat had convinced me that theory nine, that Salem had never got on the pod in the first place, was wrong. Theories five and seven, spontaneous combustion and time warp, Cat had dismissed out of hand. I hadn't. But there was another reason I'd finally agreed to cross them off. One I hadn't told Cat. I'd counted the number of people who got on the pod, 21. I counted the number of people that got off, 21. I realised that if Salem had spontaneously combusted or slipped into a time warp, only 20 people would have got off. That left theories three, four and six. Three and four both depend- depended on us having somehow missed Salem when he got out. I told the police there was only about 2% chance of our having missed him, which meant there's 98% chance that Salem had emerged from the pod in disguise. At first we thought this theory unlikely, but the more I considered it over the 54 hours and two minutes, the more possible it seemed. When we went up to London Eye with Dad the next day, I'd noticed a time when you can put a disguise on with nobody noticing. It's when everybody turns to have their souvenir shot taken. Everyone faces one way for almost a full minute until the, the flash goes off. So I'd given the souvenir shot of Sailor's pod that c- the cat ball another look. I kept going back to this pink sleeve, the one we thought was the girl in the pink fluffy jacket at the back of the picture, waving at the camera. I don't know when I first realised. Maybe it was the 18 pictures that Cat took of our washing line when she was using up Salem's film. With the sleeves of sweatshirt jumpers and blouses waving in the wind. Or maybe it was the way I'd seen Cat struggle into her fur collared jacket. 
The morning she'd rushed out to get the photos of the strange man enlarged. The sleeve in the souvenir shop was not somebody waving, it was somebody changing. A pink sleeve, waving or drowning, waving or changing, depending on how you looked at it. The pink, the girl in the pink fluffy jacket was Salem's accomplice. They topped identities in the pod, a wig, a jacket, sunglasses. That was all it needed. And I remembered Aunt Gloria saying how Salem was a practical joker, not a theoretical joker, like me, but a practical one, which means he actually carried out his jokes. Maybe this was a practical joke on a big scale. For a brief period, I wondered if Salem had a girlfriend, a girlfriend whom nobody mentioned. Maybe a girlfriend even Aunt Gloria didn't know about? A factor X in the equation. The Corollius force, the thing that had deflected Salem off his course. Then, in the 54 hours and two minutes of thinking time, another possibility occurred to me. Marcus, the boy, the mosher, the boy in the tempest. Salem, said a mate, called in from Manchester. While we were crossing the Jubilee footbridge on the way to the eye. Later, we'd heard from the police that everybody questioned in Manchester, including Marcus, had said they'd not heard from Salem since he'd left. It was an inconsistency. Somebody was lying. Marcus, maybe. The police reported on Salem's friend al friend's alibis the day he disappeared. Marcus's mum had said he was on his way, on, on, his, on a day out with the scouts. So I thought, maybe Marcus was out with the scouts the way Kat and I had gone swimming. Or the way Kat was supposed to be at school the day that, when she'd really gone up to town to have her hair flare consultation. I didn't know much about Marcus, only that he and Salem were friends. They were both half Asian, an all boys school. They were both moshers, which means casual, cool dudes that they'd starred in the tempest at school salem had played ferdinand somebody must have played the only female role miranda who cat told me was a dish rag maybe it was marcus maybe that's how he'd had the idea marcus very likely when the girl had got off the motorbike at the scooter show freestyle jumps everybody had assumed she was a man until she'd taken off her helmet and loosened her long hair maybe cat and i had done the reverse Assumes the person in the pink fluffy jacket was a woman, just because she had long hair, male or female. It depends on how you looked at it. Marcus, almost certainly. Of the 21 people leaving the pod, there had been no extra woman, no female who could have merged from under the wig and sunglasses disguise. But there had been a lad. The lad we'd taken for the girl in the pink fluffy jacket's boyfriend. The boy with the chubby brownish cheeks? Marcus, definitely. That's when I remembered Salem shaving off his moustache. If he was to become the, the girl in the pink fluffy jacket, he needed to be clean shaven. As did Marcus. Everything pointed to Marcus. Then the final jigsaw piece fell into place. What the woman security guard said was that we left Earl's Court. I didn't slot it into the rest of the pattern until the 87th kick of the garden shed. Kat had asked her where the strange man called Christy had gone. She'd replied he'd gone home with a stomach bug. A bug she didn't believe in. With him, it's always the same. Sick this, dentist that, dead uncle other. Never rain, but it pours, just like his name. Detective Inspector Pierce had mentioned Marcus's name to us only once. But only once was enough. Enough for me, at least. Because I'm going to be a meteorologist when I grow up. The name Flood had stuck with me as interesting all along. The strange man had lied to us at Earl's Court and lied to us again in Mile End. Both times he'd known more than he said. He and Marcus were related. They were both called Flood. For some reason, he had helped Marcus and Salem carry out their practical joke. Maybe because that's all he thought he was. But it wasn't a practical joke. It was also part of a bigger plan for Salem to run away. <coughs> because I think everybody knew by then. Salem hadn't been abducted. He'd vanished by his own choice. He never wanted to go to New York. A clue to this had been the guidebook in his backpack. There were no creases on the spine, which meant Salem had never opened it, which meant going to New York didn't make him that excited. But the London I did, and vanishing while riding it was the best and most exciting way of running away he could think of. A weather detective is somebody who uses observations and measurements to make theories, and if the theories are right, they will correctly predict weather patterns. Finding out what had happened to Salem and where he would like to be was exactly like that. I made observations and constructed theories and then found out more facts of Cat's help. And when the facts and theories fitted, I thought we'd be able to track Salem down, just like you track a storm system and predict where it'll make landfall. Only something had gone wrong. Salem hadn't disappeared at the end of the trail. 
There was only Marcus. And Marcus stood in the kitchen, staring at the floor. At the floor. And when everybody stared, started talking at once to him, he started crying. His head was down, but you could hear him. And see his shoulders moving. I've got a very bad feeling in my esophagus again. 